Welcome everybody to the Archaeological Research Facilities Wednesday Brown Bag Talks for the ARF. Um, let me begin with uh, acknowledging our place and our, and our privilege here. Um, because we are recording this talk to post on YouTube at a later date. Um, every time we start something here, we should acknowledge that the Archaeological Research Facility is located in Huichin, the ancestral and unceded territory of Chochenyo speaking Olani people, successors to the historic and sovereign Verona Band of Alameda County, who are here today, of course. We acknowledge that this land remains of great importance to the Olani people and that the art community inherits a history of archaeological scholarship. scholarship that has disturbed Ohlone ancestors and erased living Ohlone people from the present and future of this land, but not permanently, of course. It is therefore our collective responsibility to critically transform our archaeological inheritance in support of Ohlone sovereignty and to hold the University of California accountable to the needs of all Native Californian, Native American, and Indigenous people with whom we work and who host us in their places. Today is my pleasure to introduce uh, doctoral candidate Wolfgang Alders, who's done significant work in Zanzibar, an island off the coast of Tanzania in East Africa, where he has been working with communities to look at the way their connections to the landscape um, are manifest in important material ways that have uh, and potentially significant contributions to the way we think about Zanzibar in the future. Um, Wolfgang's been pursuing this research now for what, six years, eight years of work. You know, he's had various inter interventions through other research and then initiated his own um, community engaged scholarship with the community there in Zanzibar in important ways, contributing back, reinvesting into the community. Um, and I'm very excited to hear what we can think of as kind of an exit talk here in the Ecological Research Facilities PhD um, community uh, in the doctoral program. From Wolfgang, so welcome. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, June. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Uh, it's great to be here as well. Thanks everyone for coming. Nice to be in person. Um, thanks everyone on Zoom as well. Uh, my talk is called Uneven Ground The Archaeology of Settlement Reorganization in Zanzibar, Tanzania. I'm um, going to go over the outlines of this presentation. First, I'm going to describe the context of where I work, the environment and social history of Zanzibar and coastal East Africa. Then I'm going to discuss uh, my research aims, questions and methods. Um, I'm going to talk about something I talked about in my last brown bag, which was uh, reconstructing the settlement system in inland Zanzibar uh, using archaeological and historical methods. Um, then I'm going to um, extrapolate on that and kind of give a, an overview of, of where I'm at now and what I kind of feel like I've concluded from uh, this phase of my research um, in this region um, for my dissertation, looking at ceramic trends, spatial analyses of settlement, zonal statistical analyses of environment in relation to settlement. And then I'm gonna wrap it up by discussing um, some trends um, with respect to long-term settlement and environment. And I'll have a conclusion and the acknowledgement. So this is uh, Zanzibar, it's the Southern uh, island in an island chain um, off the coast of East Africa. You can see here it's in the Western Indian Ocean. This is what's referred to by archaeologists as the Swahili coast, um, extending from approximately Somalia to Mozambique. It also includes Northwest Madagascar, the Comoro Islands, um, and then a series of offshore islands uh, of which Zanzibar is the largest. So it's today part of the modern nation of Tanzania. Um, this is a closer up view of the island. Zanzibar, um, there are uh, uh, some modern towns that I've, I've listed here, the biggest of which is Zanzibar Stone Town, which is the main urban settlement on the island. Um, using some satellite imagery, uh, reclassified uh, land use satellite imagery, I've reconstructed, uh, this is basically modern settlement in 2016, so it's showing areas of, um, of, of houses and, and modern settlement. You can see the, the largest concentration is in the west here by Zanzibar Stone Town. Um, there's also settlement in the rural areas, um, especially in the north part of the island, northwest. There's also settlement on the coastal fringes, well as um, but some, but slightly less in the south. Um, what you can see if you juxtapose this um, image of uh, land use classification for modern settlement with the uh, historical zone of the plantation system, um, you see how the arms of the historical zone really map onto 
um, modern settlement. So there's uh, a landscape history in, in these rural areas that very much relates to the development of this plantation system in the 19th century. Um, this plantation system developed primarily to produce cloves, which are pictured up here on the left. Uh, cloves are a spice. They were very valuable in the 19th century. Today, Zanzibar is still a large producer of cloves. Zanzibar and Pemba both produce a, a large share of the world's cloves. Um, towards the late 19th century into the 20th century, clove prices fell and the plantation system diversified to produce um, copra from coconuts. And so this plantation system was developed through slave labor, so through, the, through enslaved, um, using the labor of enslaved mainland East Africans. Um, slavery was abolished on the island in 1890 when there was a transition to a system of kind of tenant, tenant squatters um, who were continually, who were continued to be exploited in various ways to produce uh, clove plantations. This is a clove tree, uh, these are coconut trees. So what I wanted to know was what kind of landscapes uh, existed in these clove plantation zones prior to the development of the plantation system and up to and during the development of the plantation system. What did the landscape look like? How were settlements organized? And how did that reflect or relate to broader trends of social transformation? Um, I also wanted to uh, investigate land use outside of the, the area specifically used for clove and coconut production. So in the Western regions, there's a lot of rice that's grown. Um, here, just pictures of rice fields. And in the east, there's a very different landscape um, running all down the east coast and into the south of the island. There are these coralline limestone bedrock areas where the land is um, very rocky. There's, uh, there's uh, very shallow soils. Um, you can see just how rocky it is. There's pretty much no soil in this picture here. So what was settlement like across these areas and how did these different environmental contexts mediate that? Um, this is the survey strip that we planned. Uh, we executed the survey in 2019, a systematic survey um, across a region. And you can see that the aim was to capture settlement within the clove plantation zone, as well as outside it in, in other areas. The idea is to, be, to reconstruct settlement across a variety of different environmental contexts. Um, just to go over now uh, briefly the, the periods of social reorganization that I wanna talk about that will frame the results of the survey and the results of my research. So Zanzibar is, has, it has, there's a late Stone Age occupation period in Zanzibar um, that ends around 12,000 years before present when Zanzibar splits off from the mainland. And after that point, it's, it's uh, as far as we know today, not occupied until about the sixth century CE when mainland East Africans, early Swahili people who are iron workers, agriculturalists, fishers, um, recolonize the island and settle in these really uh, small coastal villages, places like Fukuchani, they also develop a, a relatively large town at Abuja Aku, which becomes interlinked into Indian Ocean trading systems in this period. But these are very coastal sites. They're directly on beaches in many cases, and they're quite small, um, except for Abuja Aku, which becomes uh, a bigger site toward the end of this period. Um, going into the 11th to 15th centuries, the early second millennium, this is when there's a period of social stratification, um, urbanism, uh, Islamic conversion across the entire Swahili coast but on Zanzibar as well. So this is a period where stone architecture in the center of Swahili settlements that um, primarily comprise of earth and thatch um, households, but uh, develop. But so you have, there are um, sort of nascent elites who are invested in constructing stone architecture, monumental mosques and tombs and things like that. Um, on Zanzibar, the, the first one of these is, is this townscape at Tumbatu, which also um, has relations with the Mkokothoni. On Pemba Island, um, other archaeologists have related this period of social stratification to uh, changes in diet. So there's a shift from pearl millet um, to rice consumption based on archaeobotanical evidence during this time. There's also a shift in the type of ceramics being produced from primarily sort of jug shaped pots to open bowls. And these other archaeologists relate this to the idea of um, new kind of Islamic cultural norms about rice based dishes in the Western Indian Ocean. So um, the idea being that nascent elites use things like communal feasting um, to kind of uh, to, to bring people together into these urban centers based around uh, rice. So this happens in Zanzibar as well, and I'll, I'll talk about that soon. Uh, around the year 1500, there's a uh, pretty dramatic settlement reorganization across the East African coast when the Portuguese um, enter the Western Indian Ocean. So the Portuguese were interested in monopolizing trade. Uh, what was previously a, uh, a series of independent and autonomous towns participating in the kind of early caravan trading and um, the, the trade um, with the Western Indian Ocean 
the Portuguese want to dominate it, they want to control it and tax it. And they're mostly unsuccessful in this regard, but they do manage to um, disrupt settlement systems. They sack a number of towns. Um, so you have towns being abandoned during this period. Uh, there's also towns that are founded in which grow though. Some of the biggest cities in East Africa today are cities that were uh, that developed and were founded in this period. Um, Zanzibar Stone Town here in the West is one of these towns. So um, it becomes in this period, the primary urban site of the island. In the second phase of this early colonial period, the Yarubid and then Busayid Omani dynasties um, pretty much replace the Portuguese system. They expel the Portuguese from the coast north of Mozambique, and then they install governors in the cities and try to control and monopolize the wealth coming out of East Africa in the same way the Portuguese did. Um, Zanzibar becomes one of the central bases of the Busayid Omani state as they contend with other uh, factions in this early period. But still during this period, their, their primary presence is in Stonetown. It's not in the landscape. Um, and so that's why I bracket this period uh, around 1830. What, what changes in 1830 is what I'm calling the late colonial period. And this is when there's a um, pretty dramatic shift in how rural landscapes are, um, are occupied and used. So um, this is when you see the development of the clove plantation system. Uh, outsiders refer to this period starting around 1830 or 1835 as this period of clove mania. Um, Sayyid Said, who's the first sultan um, of, or he's, he's one of the most important sultans uh, in this period, is the first to develop a clove estate basically on his plantation in the 1820s. By the 1830s, though, he's encouraged um, a number of other Omani planters who are related to him um, to settle in the rural areas and to develop cloves because of how profitable the crops are. And so this spirit of clove mania refers to this episode where um, all across the island, other crops are being uprooted and not planted and left fallow to make room for clove trees. So um, in this period, Zanzibar becomes a net importer of staple foods for the first time. And there's also this uh, account that uh, there's like meteorological measurements done in the 1870s had to be, or basically it was remarked they had to be redone from previous meteorological me measurements in the 1850s because of how much the landscape had changed in that period, in this mid 19th century period. Um, so there's uh, a lot of deforestation, uh, a lot of changes to the rural landscape. And this is where you see the establishment of what could be considered a plantation aristocracy of slave owning um, Omani elites, also Swahili and Indian people as well, um, but mostly Omani um, Arabs who are controlling land and um, using the land to produce in a new type of way. So not just for subsistence, but for a kind of cash crop. Um, the second phase of this is during the British, is, is when the British protectorate begins in 1890. And this is um, this continues to 1963 um, and ends with the independence of Zanzibar and the Zanzibar Revolution, which joins the island to Tanzania. Um, but so, as I'll talk about later, material evidence, as well as these historical sources and the kind of spatial patterns that I observe in my analysis, all sort of corroborate that around 1830, there's a really fundamental transformation in the way that landscapes are used in rural areas. It relates to um, both demographic changes as a result of bringing in mainland enslaved people, as well as um, the kind of new economic system that develops with clove plantations. Okay, so my research aims were to reconstruct settlement patterns in Zanzibar's plantation landscapes and in rural inland areas in general. I first wanted to, when I started my, my research, I wanted to look at how field systems were. I wanted to look at how agricultural changes uh, could be mapped onto settlement shifts. And I realized quickly, well, there are no settlement patterns in the inland areas to even compare them against. Um, settlement has really uh, been studied archeologically uh, at coastal sites. And it was first necessary to just reconstruct the settlement system landscape in inland areas. Next, I wanted to investigate um, rural settlement dynamics from a long-term perspective and theorize how these dynamics relate to episodes of social reorganization and transformation. Um, so rural settlement dynamics, urban hinterland dynamics are things that get studied in different periods in Swahili archaeology. In the pre-colonial period, there's a lot of research on this. And my aim was to kind of create a study that would link uh, a long-term perspective together from the pre-colonial period phase of earliest occupation to the late colonial period. And then I wanted to broaden the view of historical ecology on the Swahili coast by integrating an investigation of agricultural environments. Um, a lot of historical archaeology focuses on coastal sites um, and focuses on marine resource subsistence and fishing. And uh, I wanted to, which is a, a very important um, you know, feature of, of Swahili landscapes, but I wanted to also look at how agricultural environments in inland areas might have also related to these transformations. This leads to my research questions, which I, uh, I'll go through as I, I think I go through the talk, but they basically relate to the aims. Um, 
and there's different methods I use for them. So, but let's talk about the first research question. Um, what are the settlement patterns in rural inland Zanzibar from the period of earliest occupation to the late colonial period? Um, and that's my yeah, question here. So to do this, I first uh, developed a, a systematic and judgmental survey um, in this, this region that I indicated before. Um, this map shows the different uh, survey transects we planned. Um, the blue transects are systematic surveys selected randomly. Um, within the squares. The green squares represent areas where, uh, through collaboration with community partners, we developed um, a, a survey plan to investigate things of interest to local community members. In the far west here, we weren't able to survey very much. That's because modern sand and gravel mining has really denuded the landscape in this region. There's also mangrove swamps. So unfortunately, we couldn't get that part of the island, but um, I basically divided up the transects we could achieve into these survey regions, which have particular environmental um, features. Um, this is an example of how these transects worked, um, right? You can see this is kind of best case scenario here where we can do shovel test bits in a grid, use a grid system to delineate site sizes where we found archeological materials. Worst case scenario is in the East here where it's not really worst case scenario, but it's just how it happened. The stony landscape means that you can't really dig shovel test bits. Up here in Kandwe, you can see we got halfway through digging our our shovel test pits, and then we hit this kind of rocky area where it's just not possible. Um, also, the, uh, the brush is very thick in this area, meaning that staying directly in the transect is quite difficult. But anyways, as a result of this, this is the kind of final uh, map I've produced uh, showing the sites we've recovered, 44 sites in total, um, seven of the pre-colonial period, four sites dating to the early colonial period, and 32 sites dating to the late colonial period, and then two sites of indeterminate period. Dating these sites, uh, for dating these sites, we mostly use um, ceramic typologies of imported ceramics, which is pretty well established um, in the East African, East African archaeology. Um, and it let us um, pretty easily narrow down uh, what period sites belong to. So I can go through these site types we recovered. I'm not going to spend too much time on this since this is what I've discussed in a previous brown bag. Um, and I wanted to get more to the spatial analyses and ceramic analyses, but briefly, um, in the 11th to 15th centuries, there are these pre-colonial uh, inland village communities at Wanakombo and Kirikacha. These are some of the largest sites we've recovered. Um, they're sites with deep soils, um, lots of ceramic materials near perennial streams. Um, there's also sites in the eastern area in these uh, Swidden field plots of modern farmers. So these are ceramic scatters. Um, the best guess is that these represent areas of the same types of agricultural activity in the past. So they probably represent sort of ephemeral or seasonal um, uh, occupation in Sweden field plots in the same way that farmers today um, use this landscape. Um, and I'll talk about that more later. Um, we also identified this, this coastal village up here at Pwani and Changani, which I won't discuss much in this talk. Going into the early colonial period, or sorry, these are just some examples. Uh, yeah, I, I, we can go back to these more people have questions later. I'm going to skip ahead for now. In the early colonial period, um, in phase one, we're really just talking about the site of Kandwi and then more of these ceramic surface scatters in the field plots of Sweden farmers today in the eastern region. So the west and central areas are not occupied in the first phase, this Portuguese period of the early colonial period. Toward the end of this period, by the late 18th or early 19th century, there's the site of Nduaku, which is a small village occupied there. Um, some examples of these sites, um, gonna go back to those later. And then in the late colonial period, uh, there are really four different types of sites we identified. There are these ceramic scatters representing um, possibly small hamlets or field houses, areas of agricultural activity in the east and west. There are things that are clearly identifiable as sort of plantation estates with stone architecture. And finally, there is the town of Chani, which is an immensely large site, um, 32 sites in general across all periods here. Um, one thing to notice is the, the persistence of these types of um, sites in the eastern region, which is uh, something I'll return to later. Um, right, so here are these ceramic scatter sites. Estates, uh, three sites really, Kibirakani, Monacombo, and Kataleni. I'm not showing this imagery of Kataleni because we didn't, uh, we, it's, it's a currently occupied house basically. And we, people who were there couldn't uh, come uh, speak with us. So we have uh, basically not gonna publish the pictures of that. Um, anyways, moving along. Um, this is the town of Chani. It kind of defeated our survey methodology, right? Because it's so big that the further you get out on this grid of shovel test bits, the more you lose in these areas between the, uh, the arms of the grid. Um, 
The next way to reconstruct settlement, um, once you get to about 1890, we found is that um, archaeological evidence for settlement patterns uh, become less useful than the historical sources that start appearing pretty much right as the British seize Zanzibar and make it into a protector in 1890. So what we found is this really, really interesting map called the, uh, the I call it the Khan Bahadur map. It's a map made by a person named Imam Sharif Khan Bahadur, who was employed by the British Survey of India and published this map in 1907. It refers to settlements made, or sorry, it refers to um, surveys conducted across the island between 1890 and 1900 is the approximation. And it shows a really, really fascinating view into the entire settlement landscape of the island, um, depicting uh, villages, towns, um, things like streams and wells, uh, roads, uh, and lots of other features. Um, so it's this really fascinating trove of information for a period which really is at the height of the plantation system. And so it's pretty hard to not uh, want to use this, right, and compare it to archaeological settlement. It's a different scale of analysis than the types of sites we're recovering, right? So it doesn't reflect things like small ceramic scatters, but it does reflect at a bigger scale um, the kind of uh, village and town communities across the island and their distribution. And so what I've done is I've interpreted this map um, using things, using the typography of the map, which is a kind of standardized format in the British Survey of India, um, along with the sort of, uh, with the, the density and quantity of settlement squares indicated by the, uh, the author of the map. And so I've divided this up into site classes. Um, this is a methodology I discussed more. Uh, we can talk about it later if people are interested in how I actually got to this, but the point being that I, I think I'm pretty confident in being able to divide these up and estimate site sizes based on the information in the map. And this produces this really amazing um, kind of almost full coverage uh, account of settlement on the island, which I can visualize through things like heat density, um, showing uh, Zanzibar stone town, uh, town size sites, large villages, small villages, and then hamlets or very small villages. Um, other features from the Khan Bahadur map that are really fascinating are um, place names listed in areas where there are no villages, right? So this suggests a really intense degree of familiarity between the author um, of this map who's working for the British colonial state, mind you, right? So there's, the, I, I'm currently researching more into this. I'm very curious to learn about how, the history of how these maps were made, the relationship between the map makers and uh, local communities, right? How much this person was given access versus excluded from certain places. That's all very um, interesting. This really is, it's a, an image of a, a kind of imperial gaze on, on Zanzibar, right? And it's the development of that systemizing of the landscape, which previous to this didn't really exist. But there are place names. Um, there are the palaces and estates of the Busayid rulers. And then there are miscellaneous things like sanatorium, um, poorhouses, um, and ruins that are listed on this map, which are not listed in archaeological gazettes. Also very interesting is the, is the hydrological system. So I've traced this from the map showing um, above ground streams and then well systems pretty much in areas all around the places where there are no streams. I think reflecting the importance of, of water um, for settlement across the island. So that's, that's kind of a summary of, of reconstructing settlement patterns um, using archeological and historical sources um, that operate at different scales, but um, show different types of uh, evidence for settlement system. Now we can compare this to um, uh, historical trends and episodes of social transformation and use uh, different lines of evidence to see how these settlement systems uh, relate to those periods. So how were these settlement systems impacted by and how did people negotiate with settlement transformation and political reorganization? Uh, I'm going to talk about ceramic analysis um, and then spatial analyses of the settlement systems we've recorded. So the first line of evidence with ceramics is that there's a changing flow um, in the access to foreign commodities. In the pre-colonial and early colonial periods, there's a very small number of um, imported ceramic shirts coming from places like the Middle East and China. Um, this is late Scrafiato uh, ware that's uh, related to pre-colonial period from about 1100 to 1400 CE. There's um, later ceramics that, um, around the 15th century um, glazed wares. This is a Wang Quan Celadon from China. And in the 17th century, this is a shirt of bachla ware of a black speckled type. Um, what all changes around 1830, though, in the, beginning of, in the beginning of the late colonial period is this shift towards um, the increasing availability of a widespread range of um, European and uh, Chinese ceramics. Um, so specifically English white ware, um, which is a hand-painted, sponge-decorated, transfer-printed um, stencil. Um, 
and uh, the white wear uh, replaces pearl wear in production um, between 1820 and 1830. Um, the fact that we didn't find, I think, a single shirt of pearl wear, it really reflects the, the specific date of around 1830, uh, which corresponds to this development of the coal plantation system. Um, so these lines of evidence converge in that way. Um, the next line of evidence with ceramics we looked at was the uh, was ceramic attribute analysis. So measuring things like ceramic temper, fabric color, and clay color in local ceramic wares. And the overall trend is from uh, what I interpret as localized to regional production and possibly the influence of mainland East African potters who were brought as enslaved people in the early 19th century. So there's a shift um, from, so, okay, so what I've basically noticed is that like temper and color seem to correspond in some way to uh, geological and soil types across the island um, in the west, central, and east regions. Um, the further west you go in Zanzibar, the sandier the landscape becomes in general. Um, so the far east has kind of silty clays. Um, the central area is a kind of um, sandy clay, and then the western area, there's it's clay sand, essentially. And this, I notice, corresponds to um, differences in coarseness in ceramic temper. So it'd be interesting to figure out, you know, where the actual sources of clay are coming from, but I suspect that the correspondences between geography and ceramic tempers reflects um, localized production of ceramics, um, and that that seems to be the case elsewhere in the Swahili coast. I think this is uh, data that kind of supports this at this regional scale. Toward the uh, beginning in the late colonial period, though, um, everything kind of uh, becomes more. Um, what's the word, consistent. Um, color of fabric and clay becomes darker in general, and then ceramics become finer and less coarse in general. Um, and so I think this reflects um, some kind of change in the way that ceramics are being produced, that clay is being sourced, that may reflect um, uh, changes in the composition of potters, communities of potters, um, uh, possibly reflecting more regional integration. Um, Ceramic types also change. So there's a shift from the pre-colonial and early colonial period where open bowls dominate the assemblage, which is the case across the Swahili coast, to a phase in the late colonial period where um, these kind of inverted rim carinated cooking pots become the central um, type of ceramic being produced, the main type. This missed category here, probably also a lot of these are from inverted rim carinated pots. They, it's, uh, there are um, less, less diagnostic forms there. Um, so this shift um, could relate to a few things. I think one, it mostly relates to the widespread availability now of imported open bowls, like this bowl here, which is an antique shop in Zanzibar, dates to the late 19th century, um, which may replace the locally made ceramic bowls. It may also reflect changes in diet. Um, cassava, it's pretty well established that cassava was introduced to Zanzibar in 1799, and cassava becomes really the staple food of enslaved people on the island in the 19th century um, and becomes widespread then. And so the shift may relate to something like, um, you know, new, new staple foods. Um, finally, it also may relate to the, the way that, that these pots are used today. So um, what you observe if you're in Zanzibar today is that inverted rim cooking pots like this are pretty much the only locally made ceramic that's still used um, on a regular basis. And they're used in contexts where people are um, preparing food in places outside of the domestic household. Um, they're also used in domestic households in some cases, but you often see them in, out in town as, as a, as a you know, kind of food cart stand where people are um, coming for lunch, um, coming to uh, eat outside of the domestic household. So there's possibly some, this is just my theory, that there's some um, relationship there where new economic conditions, new economic circumstances, where suddenly there are lots of people working um, in context outside of their own domestic households, produces a situation where there's a greater demand for things like um, you know, um, uh, bowls like this for provisioning uh, workers and, and people like that, enslaved people. Um, so now I want to get into some of the spatial analyses um, that also correspond to changes relating to the color plantation system. Um, the, the, the statistical analyses for settlement in the pre-colonial and early colonial period really just, they reflect what you can kind of see with your own eyes because there are so few sites, right? Um, this is a rank size graph. It's in a, it has a, con, or a, sorry, a convex pattern, which uh, it basically reflects the relationship between site size and site rank. And so it's a way of visualizing how integrated or unintegrated sites were across the landscape. What a, con, a convex distribution like this suggests 
is that the largest site in the, in the system is smaller than would be expected in what's called the log normal prediction. And that smaller sites are larger than would be expected. So this suggests a relatively um, unintegrated or um, autonomous system of regional settlement. Um, and I'll show you uh, different examples later. Um, clustering suggests uh, a sort of dispersed settlement pattern. And I think this accords well with other um, regions of the Swahili coast where the pre-colonial period is characterized by these kind of autonomous villages, um, relatively unintegrated within the political system, not dominated by a central um, center. Um, this is kind of the case in Pemba as well. Um, early colonial period, there's four sites, right? So this statistical this analyses are kind of just reflect what you can see. Uh, what to, what's there to note here is that really the eastern region is the only area that remains occupied during the uh, first phase of this period. Uh, later on, Juaku um, is occupied in the central region. So going into the late colonial period, there's a change though. Um, instead of a totally convex settlement system, we now have this thing called a primo-convex. I never said that word out loud before, I've just been reading it. Primo-convex uh, rank size system, where there's still this kind of um, convex uh, uh, graph for the uh, smaller sites in the settlement system, but now there's a very large site at the top. And that's that town of Chani. Um, there's also um, statistically significant clustering um, across the region. So there's two different changes, a, a change from dispersed to clustered, and then a change from um, a convex settlement system to this primo convex settlement system, which I'm gonna argue later, I think reflects the specific conditions of the plantation landscape. So this is all right, a theoretical model, um, it's all, based on a kind of normative assumptions about how urban landscapes, rural, urban rural landscapes work. And I'm gonna say that this reflects a very specific condition of a plantation system, which I'll talk about in a moment. If we move on now and compare these spatial trends to the settlement data from the map we discussed from about 1890 to 1900, right after the, um, the sites that we recorded archeologically, uh, we see similar things. So analyzing settlement across the whole island, spatial clustering is, uh, very statistically significant at a variety of, of distances. And there's this similar primal convex rank size distribution for sites, um, mostly a convex system indicating this kind of the, the persistence of, of supposedly autonomous villages. But now you have Zanzibar stone town, right? Which is the very top, which is kind of changing the graph. If we analyze this um, in different regions of the settlement system, we get a different view, right? So in the Northern part of the island, it's a convex settlement system. Uh, there's clustering as well. In the central area where, where Zanzibar Stone Town is, we get uh, this, this primal convex distribution. And then in the south, it's back to being a, a, a convex system as well um, with, with clustering too. So how do we explain all this? Um, let's return to the research question. How do we explain these ceramic trends and the spatial analyses in terms of our question? Um, this change from dispersed to clustered settlement patterns. Um, this reflects, I think, um, preferences for favored environmental zones. That's, that's my, the main explanation I can see is that around 1830, because of this phase of agricultural transformation, there's a, a renewed emphasis on um, settling in and using zones that are um, specifically favorable for types of agricultural production, which result in spatial clustering as um, large numbers of people um, come into these areas for the first time who are um, brought as enslaved people. The second shift is this change from convex to primal convex distribution in site size hierarchies. Um, and what I suggest this reflects is the specific conditions of the plantation landscape. So um, a convex rank size distribution normally reflects something like autonomous um, settlements who are relatively unintegrated politically. But of course we know historically that wasn't really the case, right? This is a, uh, a slave state, essentially, in the 19th century. It's a plantation system where elites in Zanzibar Stone Town dominate the landscape and dominate production and um, have a, a kind of um, system that funnels wealth from production in rural areas into the, the urban center. Um, so what this means is that um, the specific conditions of that political system produce a, uh, a rank size graph that looks more like something you'd expect to see in a system of sort of autonomous villages. Um, in fact, it's not the case. It's actually more the case that you have political elites basically keeping people tied to the land. Um, so the urban center is not so much a place where population flows, people come to um, because they are attracted by opportunities in urban areas, but rather the urban center functions more like, I, I argue, like a gated community, basically. Stonetown is smaller than you'd expect. 
for a, a normative urban landscape. And the elites in Stonetown used power to keep people tied to the land in these plantation systems, first as enslaved people, and then later in the development of this kind of tenant-based squatter system. Um, so what does this mean in terms of social transformation? Um, what I argue is that the specific contours of state power in Zanzibar um, during this time um, explain some of the uh, political events of the late 19th century. So one is the, um, the ease with which the British are able to seize state power in 1890. Um, Zanzibar is an unintegrated state that is basically focused around the exploitation of agricultural resources, meaning that um, that the, the landscape and the people living in it were not integrated within a project of, of state development or state formation, meaning that for the British, um, it was very easy to simply depose the, the ruler at the head of this landscape and, um, and uh, you know, take control in that way. Anti-colonial resistance, of course, happened across the East African coast and in Zanzibar, for example, the Abu Shiri revolt, but it happened um, through a series of um, non-state actors, basically. The state itself was quite weak, there were all these other hierarchical elements um, in places like the, the sort of villages and towns of Zanzibar, um, as well as on the mainland, which organized resistance in different ways, not at the level of the state. So I think my spatial analyses of uh, settlement integration um, within the plantation system reflects the uh, particular contours of how the state formed in Zanzibar in the 19th century and then how it responded to um, colonial intrusions. So, Lastly, I want to talk about um, the different environmental contexts of Zanzibar and how they mediated um, Swahili social development and then the development of the colonial plantation system. Um, I analyzed this through a method called zonal statistical analysis, using data sets of different environmental contexts across the island and comparing settlement to these different um, zones in a statistical way. And so these are the kind of zones that I analyzed settlement across for both my archaeological sites as well as for settlement. Um, it's, it's a lot, um, I'm gonna skip through kind of some things. So what I initially sort of found here is that um, based on site locations, I could create aggregated suitability models for site locations for all periods. So what I found is that the pre-colonial village, inland village sites favored the same environmental zones as late colonial sites. Um, since late colonial sites developed during this period of this clove mania period, right? And reflective preference for environments suitable for agricultural production. I'm arguing it's not a stretch to suggest that pre-colonial inland village residents shared this preference too. Um, these are some of the zones that um, I analyzed that used to create these sort of aggregates for site suitability. Um, so these darker areas here reflect um, the conditions that I observed um, for site locations for both the pre-colonial and the um, late colonial periods. Um, and then I just wanted to note that this, this model of site suitability for my archaeological sites maps really well onto the actual known settlement system recorded in the 1907 map. Um, you can see, especially down here, like just the way that um, known settlements really follow the, um, the, uh, the areas of high probability for site prediction, right? Um, but what this suggests is that, and what this kind of shows is, I didn't know, but there's a fragmented history of settlement in these favored agricultural zones in the West and Central regions. Um, from about 1100 to 1400, there are um, these inland village sites that we recorded, which follow the same trends as the, um, the, the, the plantation system, which develops in the 19th century. Um, so if we go back in time, right, in the late first millennium, Swahili communities settled permanently in coastal areas of the island, where there are these bountiful marine resources. And the question is, why would people leave the coast to occupy inland areas permanently, starting in the early second millennium? It's likely not population pressure um, since settlements are small and dispersed in this period, but since pre-colonial villages are found in the same environmental zones as sites of the late colonial plantation system, it's not too much of a leap to assume that agricultural products were also uh, part of the equation. This, this is corroborated by the presence of millet bread oven fragments found at both these pre-colonial villages, as well as the large quantities of these open bowls we found, which are associated with elsewhere with rice-based dishes. So these inland village communities may have been settled by farmers wishing to meet some kind of demand for grain crops driven by new Islamic cultural norms of the Western Indian Ocean. The presence of imported luxury ceramics at these sites attest to what inland villagers may have been able to acquire in exchange for their grain. Um, these sites are abandoned along with the stone town in the, 19th, in the 14th century, and these favorable agricultural zones were not reoccupied again until the late colonial period, 
when agricultural production became a focus of social and economic life under the plantation system once again. So the emerging view is somewhat paradoxical. The most agriculturally fertile regions of the island were settled sporadically. The settlement history of the region is fragmented and associated with specific conditions of demand for socially or economically um, yeah, in demand products. Um, then, oops, what happens? So then in the Eastern region, um, equally paradoxically, settlement and land use um, in these agriculturally barren and sort of marginal Eastern regions is persistent. Um, and continuous from the early second millennium to the present. Um, from the earliest period of inland occupation, we find ceramic scatters in these cleared stony field plots, which are farmed today using slash and burn methods of Sweden agriculture. Um, in this region, people have developed adaptations to deal with shallow soils and agricultural pests. So this method, uh, which is called Kupiga Makongo in Swahili, is a method of cutting out um, coral uh, bedrock landscapes to conserve soil. Um, it's a seasonal thing that happens over a long, long term, and I think it's incrementally sort of transformed these landscapes and the field plots into uh, more productive places that conserve soil um, more effectively. There's also the construction of stone field walls uh, for dealing with agricultural pests. And finally, there are is uh, well construction, which uh, I'll talk about in a moment. But so since the eastern region was occupied continuously from the first uh, period of, of, of occupation in the early second millennium to the present, why would this occur when the Western areas are more agriculturally fertile? Why bother with all this when Western areas are so much easier to farm? Why does the Eastern region have such a permanent history of settlement despite the relative marginality of the landscape there? I theorize that through all periods, small Swahili communities favored the Eastern region for a few reasons unrelated to agricultural production. Uh, the first of these is proximity to reefs. So along the Eastern region, there are Reefs just directly offshore, which are easily accessible to small scale fishers. You can go out with a canoe or you can go out just by yourself and fish um, on the beach. Um, uh, you can also practice seaweed farming, which occurs there today. Comparably in the West, reefs, reefs are further offshore. Uh, they require a larger degree of social coordination and larger fishing ships to access the fish there. But in the East, uh, I could see that there'd be a preference for settlement in this region simply because of the uh, ability to access fish on, on a small scale in a kind of opportunistic way. What we found in these Sweden field plots that we found ceramic scatters in is we also found things like shell. Uh, there's no shell in the inland villages in the west and central regions. Um, well, it seems that, that um, agricultural production was probably the means of subsistence there. But in the east, we find things like uh, these kind of shell scatters in fields. And that corresponds with um, modern practices relating to land use in this region. So um, the way that Sweden field plots work today, um, they're no longer uh, so shifting because of uh, large population numbers today, but farmers um, work the land. Uh, they often bring their families out and camp for a period um, in the planting season. And um, they'll do things, they'll um, use specific types of material culture like um, aluminum cooking pots and water jugs and things like that um, to uh, cook food while they're out there camping and farming the land. And so, I, my theory is that the, the kind of ceramic scatters we see in these field plots from as early as the 11th century um, are produced by the same types of practices, people going out and camping on the landscape, um, farming, and then going back to their settled communities later. Um, also, so wells. So th these wells are, were, were things that were um, recorded you know, in, 19, in the early uh, or late 19th century by, uh, on the map. Uh, there are also wells in the eastern region where we look and we come across them in the landscape. This is another um, uh, adaptation, you could say, that uh, enabled settlement in this region. So the second factor that might um, have been um, a cause for this long-term persistent settlement in the eastern region is uh, the seclusion and kind of uh, security of the rocky, stony landscape. Um, so this is the site of Kandui here. Um, and this is the site of Paniam Changani. Paniam Changani is a pre-colonial Swahili village occupied up until about the 15th century. Um, after the 15th century, it appears to have been abandoned. Kandui, meanwhile, is inland from the site um, on this rocky stony plateau, which you can see a view of here. Um, and Kandui was founded about the 15th century, um, the late 15th century, early 16th century, and then persists into the 19th century. And so uh, the best that I can theorize is that there might be some spatial reason why Kandu was founded um, pretty much the same time Pani and Chantani was abandoned. And this period corresponds to this period of Portuguese incursion. So the Portuguese, we know, sailed up and down the east, the east coast of the island. 
Um, and it may have been the case that residents relocated from coastal areas to Conway because of how secluded it is. This is a viewshed model showing how the plateau really makes um, settlement behind it um, much less visible from the coast. So it would have been a sort of defensive um, and, and secluded environment, a kind of naturally fortified area that residents in this turbulent period of Portuguese colonialism may have occupied after abandoning uh, the coastal site of Plani Amshagani while still having access to these near shore reefs, not that far, it's only a few kilometers. Here's a picture of our survey team. This is the, the single kind of stony path up to the top of the plateau where the site is located. Um, you can see the possible defensive or fortified possibilities of the site. Um, so these two reasons, um, access to reefs and seclusion and kind of um, fortification, I argue are some of the reasons why settlement is so much more persistent in the Eastern regions, despite its agricultural marginality. Um, in contrast, the Western regions uh, experience settlement growth in these kind of fits and starts in this fragmented um, pattern uh, related to demand for specific agricultural products. Um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, the settlement, the, the project reconstructed inland settlements um, and we theorized some um, things relating to uh, social transformations um, across different periods from the pre-colonial era to the late colonial period. Um, and I'd like to thank um, my team, uh, my advisors, um, everyone here at the ARF. Um, thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Nico and June, uh, for hosting me here. Um, yeah, that's it. I'll open it for questions. Should we'll start, otherwise, so <laughs> All right, awesome. Okay. What's, okay. Ne what's next? Uh, next um, is depending on you know grants I get and things like that. I've applied for a postdoc actually. Next is a plan to I think shift focus more to the urban environment, the Zanzibar. So reconstructing rural inland landscapes. Um, it gives some insights into the formation of like the urban center, but what I would like to research more now is something like um, the development of the urban center itself at Stonetown from the beginning of the early colonial period into the, the present. Um, and looking at how these rural settlement dynamics related to the development of that urban center. Um, that's what I could see as a future project. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, June or Christine, both have questions. I have to get going real quick, so I'm going to jump in ahead of the side right here. I have one copy too. So. <laughs> kind of quick. So awesome. A lot of work. So a lot of time. Ago, but one of the things I really want to kind of give you a shout out for is, you know, I don't have to do this, but there's still work. The community partners so far away. We got potentially with the whole very recently. So I just want to give you all kudos for them hanging with it. I'm not giving up. Excuse me. Oh, thanks. But it was huge. So I just want to say that. Um, and then, um, you know, the interest in, for me is also that, that connection to the ceramics and stone pattern, right? So the mm -hmm. ceramics are that kind of daily, the quotidian toolkit for people cooking and eating every day. Right? Yeah. And so you have them, and you're looking at these transformations. And I know you had identified the clay sources and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you did it, you, know, you started to look at temp, where you started to look at the kinds of things that, you know, heating regimes and things like that. Mm -hmm. And what I would ask is, you know, you made that, um, a connection between changing culinary traditions mm -hmm. and the way people were being organized and the way that maybe people are um, being forced, you know, forced to do labor versus those that were already there. And I start to feel like we lose sight of those that were already there and we start talking about those that were forced to mm -hmm. do things. Um, what do you think the relationship is between where those folks were and how they lived and the things in the conservative food tradition? What was the, what was the kind of, you, you, it apart a little bit finer how those things are reflected by the ceramics you know sure yeah food. right Dif two, two different groups you're talking about so there's there's enslaved mainland east africans who were brought there um to labor in the colonial plantation system there's also the indigenous swahili people um right so around the mid-19th century uh historical sources suggest that these two groups were about equal in size that, that, so this is a tremendous demographic transformation um Differentiating between uh, these groups using ceramic evidence alone is, is difficult. Um, it's certainly the case that this, this averted carinated cooking pot form develops in Zanzibar prior to the, the cloth plantation system. Um, so there's uh, an archeologist, Sarah Croucher, who's shown that this 
is probably continuous as a form from about the 16th century to the, or really into the 20th century. Um, and it's a derived form from earlier, uh, what's called like late Tana tradition TAW ceramics that are, are part of the Swahili ceramic tradition on the coast. Um, so the fact that it becomes so common and widespread, so I'm, I'm, I guess I would argue that like the ceramic form is something that develops um, in, uh, on the island internally prior to the, these groups. Then I think the changes in the, the, the temper and the color may relate to the, the, the transformations as a result of um, enslaved people being brought to the island. Um, the, 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 the imported ceramics may also suggest something. So it's definitely the case that there are far more imported ceramics in the Western and Central areas in the plantation zones than in the East, where I think historically uh, indigenous Swahili people are attested to, to have lived for a long time. So there's all these kind of um, 20th century uh, historical, you know, sort of propaganda descriptions from in the, in the time of politics in Zanzibar that, that are these sort of racial characterizations of Arabs in the West and then it's Swahili people in the East. And it's like, these people have always lived there. And so that's not necessarily the case at all, but um, it definitely reflects the exclusion of Swahili people from the wealth of the plantation system. I think the fact that there's far fewer imported ceramics in the 19th century in the East uh, may reflect that that kind of exclusion. Um, but yeah, in the West, between like plantation owners and then enslaved people, it's very difficult to distinguish who's using what. And Sarah Croucher argues that um, there was a lot of kind of, that, that there really wasn't a, a distinction in like who used what. There was a lot of uh, reciprocity and gift giving and sharing uh, within the kind of patron client relationships of um, uh, enslaved people and, um, and the plantation owners that resulted in these artifacts being all over the landscape at every type of site from field houses to um, big plantation estates. I don't know if that really answers your question, but something I'm thinking about, yeah, and definitely will pursue more. Um, thank you, yeah. Christine. I just wanted to ask you about, uh, I was interested with your cassava. Mm -hmm. You said that it comes in at kind of a certain time, it comes in dominant, I guess, produced crops, but also probably consumed crops yeah. linked to that pottery. Mm -hmm. And that there's a change in uh, not only crop production, food crop production, not so, putting that back, food crop production for the residents, but also. Uh, Yeah, um, historical sources definitely suggest that cassava was the food of enslaved people um, in Zanzibar. And so it comes yeah, in 1799 um, and it becomes this staple crop that really, it's like behind the cloak is the cassava. It's like the thing that allows um, enslaved people to, it's, like it's very cheap, yeah. You know, um, it's productive, low energy. Yeah, and so still today on the coast, there's, there's um, anthropological research on the coast describing how cassava is still today associated with poverty, with um, instability, with like, yeah, basically being so this cheap food, pretty much, yeah. Um, so the relationship between cassava and these averted cooking, and cooking pots, I, I can't be sure of. It's a theory, basically, that you see the change happen at the same time, that these cooking pots become predominant at the same well, time. What was, what was the main diet before cassava? Before cassava. Um, so I think it's rice. Mostly in the western areas, you can grow rice. Yeah, um, rice, but also in these eastern regions, right? Cassava is what supplants things being grown before that in these sweet, sweet and field plots. You can't grow rice in the eastern regions because it's so stony. It's not actually the African rice; it's uh, it's or is it sativa Asian rice? Yeah, it comes from Madagascar. Yeah, it comes from Madagascar. I think is the theory. But so the question is like, what were people growing in these sweet and field plots in the east before they had cassava? And there's other crops there too today. There's taro. There's um, there's I know the Swahili names, but now I'm thinking of what the names are in English. The taro, um, another root is it arrow root maybe? Is that cassava? Arrow, that's it. Left southern American. Yeah. And so American. right. So there's taro. There's um, sweet potato, and there's um, yeah, I think arrow root is the other one. But, so these are other crops grown today. So the, it could be that these crops were brought earlier in the past because rice comes 
through this Austronesian link from Madagascar, it's possible you also have, um, uh, or oh, no, the other one is a purple yam, I think. Is that one? There's a there's a yam that's from Southeast Asia. I forget what it's called. I have to look it up. There's a Southeast Asian, yeah, um, taro as well, coming from from Southeast Asia. And so that that that's a theory. There's there's a, a 12th century um, Arabic historical source that refers to Swahili people on the coast eating millet, bananas, and it says a tube called kalari, a tuber called kalari. So it's like who knows what that means, but there was some tuber on the coast in the 12th century. So yeah, it could be that these. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. Of, of sort of staple crops that really changes right. the stability of our agriculture. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, there's so this. So archaeobotanical research on this would be really interesting, and there really is none after the pre-colonial period. So it's like all speculation based on, yeah, um, yeah. Um, so it's definitely also the 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 historical description of clove mania, where people are ripping out every other clove to, uh, crop to plant cl clove, suggests that probably things like rice um, and other types of subsistence production were kind of pushed aside for cloves, which is why Zanzibar becomes an importer of food in the 19th century. Um, but yeah, yeah, so certainly, definitely these, these things are happening, these transformations, yeah. Thank so you for Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, remind us the Zanzibar Central Republic, what was the name of that with other plantation environments? Because the central place here in Kazakhstan, mm -hmm. a lot of that comes from from really modern Europe and right, yeah, for sure. Yeah, right. So the, the kind of normative assumptions of that, that the theories of that of rank size are based on come from, yeah, like a, a European kind of town urban landscape environment. Um, yeah, it's something I have to look into. I, whether, yeah, comparing a rank size and analysis with other plantation systems would be very interesting because I think it's, very, it's the, the, the results of the, that graph really specifically show something about the plantation landscape, which is not a normative urban environment, not a normative uh, rural environment. Um, and I think the graph really reflects something particular about how um, plantation elites like kept people in the land um, while still amassing lots and lots of wealth, comparable wealth to like an urban center elsewhere, but without the population flows into that urban center. Um, yeah, right, very extractive, um, certainly. Um, and I think, Contributing to the specific way the state became organized in the 19th century. Well, there's lots of plantation studies around. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wonder how, yeah, if rank size has been applied like that. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Are there questions in the Zoom to look at now? I don't know. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, well, Maria Young asked, my mother asked, where did you get that great map? Um, I got it through perusing archival sources, basically, just kind of by happenstance. Um, that's the answer, yeah. Um, any other questions on Zoom? I guess not. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>